So welcome everybody online. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Nancy G and I'm a lecturer in architectural design and the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning here at the University of Melbourne. And I begin today's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, which may be multiple lands given the different locations of all of us. And I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and place um, and acknowledge them um, Indigenous knowledge in the academy. And I'm delighted today to welcome Takeshi Hayatsu, who is a founding director of Hayatsu Architect, based in London, to give um, today's talk titled Material Anthropology. So Takeshi will discuss his ongoing material research projects and experimentations um, in both his teaching and practice. So we're really excited to have you join us. Thank you for saying yes to us, Takeshi. Um, and we're hoping to have some questions at the end. So if everybody has any questions, there's a Q and A button below. Feel free to um, ask any questions, and we'll get to them at the end. But otherwise, welcome, Takashi, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, uh, yes, this is uh, I'm I'm uh, talking from London now. It's a uh, morning here. And uh, yeah, sorry, I might sort of uh, start slowly because I'm kind of still waking up. But yes, um, this is uh, Takeshi Hayatsu, and uh, I have a practice called Hayatsu Architects, and uh, based in London. Um, so I start with this uh, 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 slides. Uh, it's uh, um, the Architecture Association's uh, library. Um, I'm originally from Japan and uh, studied architecture in Tokyo. And I moved to London to complete my diploma and graduated from the Architecture Association in 1997. Uh, since then, I worked for David Chipperfield, Horst Tompkins, and 6A Architects before setting up my own practice in 2017. In some way, I started rather late um, after having 20 years of work experience. And I was also it was also long enough to think Japan is no longer my home uh, by default. Um, and I became an outsider to my own country. And I somehow learned to acquire a gaze of outsider, which offers somehow fresh meanings and interpretations on what you see. To explain my position, perhaps I can use this reference. Uh, this is uh, Gyofu architecture pseudo-Western style architecture. It was a style of Japanese architecture which outwardly resembled Western style construction, but relied on traditional Japanese techniques. It flourished during the early Meiji period, which was uh, 1868 to 1912, and disappeared as knowledge of Western techniques became more widespread. Meiji period is a pivotal point in the Japanese history uh, Japanese people moved from being an isolated feudal society at risk of colonization by European powers to the new paradigm of modern industrialized nation state, an emergent great power influenced by Western scientific, technological, philosophical, political, legal, and aesthetic ideas. Gyofu style buildings were built by Japanese carpenters using traditional construction techniques, but with a layout and external ornamentation uh, based on the, the, their observation of Western style buildings um, without former architectural training. Gyofu style buildings were uh, built by Japanese carpenter, and it employed a skilled and materials they had, which was carpentry, not masonry. And this can be seen as a limitation. However, precisely because of that limitation, they managed to create such an intriguing and ambiguous architectural language. It looks familiar, but also strange at the same time. It also embodies a sort of naive optimism, optimism in its design, unlike intellectual play and irony often employed in the postmodern architecture style in the late 20th century, 
the Gyofu architecture still transcends the spirit of carpenters at the time. One can still feel their excitement to the unknown uh, uh, adventure into the brave new world. And I believe that the new architecture emerges from these misinterpretations arising from the limitation of information, skills, and materials. You have to be inventive from the resources you have at hand. Now, the architecture critic Irene Scarba wrote about Robinson Crusoe in his essay, The Architect as Bricol, in 2011, and it states, to the materials res rescued from the wreck, Robinson adds the resources from the island. A tree trunk is made into the keelson of his boat. The bark of the holly is boiled into a sludge and smeared over its hull. Robinson himself is part of this arsenal, his body bearing the marks of construction in so many cuts, burns, scars, and bruises. With the passing of time, his identity becomes indistinguishable from that of the island. Savage mind is neither the mind of savages nor that of a primitive or archaic humanity, but rather mind in its untamed state. So this was the quote from the French anthropologist uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Lévi-Strauss talks about bricolage in the first chapter of his book, The Savage Mind, and he offers an, as one of the examples the ideal palace of the Facta Cheval. And this is Cheval's ideal palace near Lyon in France. Cheval was a postman and he constructed this building all by himself over 33 years. It is a realization of his wild dreams using stones and pebbles he collected while he, he was delivering letters to people. When I visited the Cheval's town in 2020, I immediately understood why he did this construction. This is the detail of a wall on the street I found and everything in his town was made from pebbles and mortar. This is a picture of Great Kanto earthquake, 1923. The magnitude of 7.9 earthquake hit Tokyo directly and devastated the city completely. At the time, many buildings were made from timber, so almost the entire city was burned down to the ground. This is one of the sketches produced by the architectural designer and researcher Konwajiro. In the aftermath of the event, people started making shelters around the trees on the streets of Tokyo, using debris such as bits of corrugated iron sheets or clothes. The shelter is sealed where the trees penetrate, with straw croaking around the necks. Kon was fascinated by people's creativity and the power of people's desire to live from the destruction. This is a book, Never More Done, written by Irene Scarba and Six A Architects, published in 2013. Bricolage is the attitude I learned whilst working at Six A, and also from Irene. It was a revelation for me to discover this way of thinking and put it in the context of architecture, because by looking at things through the lens of bricolage, we are able to connect distant time and places. I began to develop my own take on bricolage based on Japanese culture and nature, where I came from originally. The bricolage works on his house like the gardener does in his garden. He's pivotal to the entire process, being at once designer, builder, and inhabitant. This is a quote from the book. Another important aspect of this is about being hands-on. In my operation, I consciously seek the opportunities to be in this position as much as possible. So I first began this journey through teaching. I had an opportunity to run a small first and second year architecture studio in Cardiff University in Wales in 2011, whilst at 6A, with my then colleague, Christine Tromra. The studio was only for two weeks, and we proposed to build a one-to-one -one replica of a Japanese tea house 
using the traditional Welsh timber frame construction. The rule was simple. We had to follow the original design strictly in terms of its proportion and fenestrations, but to transform it by adapting the local construction metal. Original tea house uh, we copied was this uh, uh, tea house called Taiyan Tea House in Kyoto. It is believed to be designed by the 16th century tea master, Sen no Rikyu. It is perhaps the most well known tea house for its radical design. It is the smallest tea house ever designed, only two tatami mats, approximately two by two meters. The walls are made from thin layers of bamboo lattice and mud. Um, Welsh timber frame construction is essentially uh, prefabricated uh, uh, panels constructed using a base system, similar to the modern flat pack garden shed. Farmhouse example from St. Fagan's outdoor museum near Cardiff, where many traditional timber buildings were preserved and reconstructed. As part of the studio, we visited the museum and learned the construction at first hand. It is called Wotton Daub, using oak stave and woven wattles like hazel rods. We learned the technique from the expert Ian Daniels from the museum. We got a permission from forestry commissions in Wales to coppice the hazels. Foraging the materials was part of the studio course tasks and soil was given from the construction site opposite of the university. The construction principle of Wotton Daub is the same in both Japan and Wales. Only difference is the materials employed. In the summer of 2019, I conducted an architecture summer school in rural Japan. I worked in collaboration with arts organization Greisler Arts. The school aim was to use locally sourced materials to establish a new economy in the village of Kiwanosato. Kiwanosato is situated in Shimonoseki, Yamaguchi Prefecture. It is a farming community in a small valley comprising 70 dwelling houses many of whom are abandoned. Like most of rural Japan, the village community is aging. The youngest in the village was 65 years old. This is a graph showing the increase of elderly population in Japan since 1950. It is projected that by 2040, over 35% of the population will be over 65. It is a national problem. This is Okamoto-san, uh, 85 years old, but was working full time seven days a week. He could do everything and knew everything from construction, constructing a two story cow shed to how to make black garlic. This is Yoshimura san, a community leader and natural born inventor who makes organic rice and vegetables. This is Yoshimura san's wife, Tokie san, a community leader and influencer. The whole village uh, follows her lead. Together, the villagers applied for government funding and set up annual community events, such as a potato harvesting festival, to invite children and young families from nearby towns. Okamoto-san named the project 10-year dream of Kiwanosato. The funding recently ran out, and this is when Greisler Arts was called in. The idea is to capture their knowledge and skills before they disappear by setting an international village school, bringing foreign students from around the world throughout the year, creating a small local economy. We called it the extended 10-year dream of Kiwanosato. Our project is to construct a bee school in the village, introducing European way of beekeeping, as well as learning the Japanese way. For this, we referenced the Slovenian beekeeping practice called is EZ Beehive. Anton Janser uh, was the uh, beekeeper. Uh, he is well known as a pioneer of modern apiculture and great expert in the field. This is Janser's apiary in the village uh, in Slovenia, now preserved as a historic monument. It has a distinctive carved projecting soffit, a typical typology of Slovenian bee house. 
and the front face of the beehive is decorated with the biblical paintings with many different colors because bees can recognize the colors of their own hives. Our idea was to copy Yance's apiary as close as possible to the original proportion, but using locally sourced materials and traditional Japanese construction techniques, such as carpentry and mud wall construction, bottom and daub. Uh, this is the elevation, axonometric, and framing diagram. Our first task was to collect enough materials from all sorts of sources, such as this old abandoned house. This is also a national problem in Japan, as about 15% of houses are left empty and uninhabited. This trend will continue to grow sharply, predicted to become over 30% in 2033. For the owner, it is too expensive to demolish, so the house is left let to decay. We obtain the permission to harvest anything we want to take from this treasure box. So we collected roofing clay tiles and mud from the walls. While demolishing, we reviewed the construction of walls. We also visited a shop in a nearby town, which was closed down five years ago. But with the um, uh, all the contents intact, the retired shop owner opened the shop for us and let us take anything we needed at the 50% discounted price. The local home center, Juntendo, was also instrumental for buying cheap off-the-shelf building components such as these concrete fittings. We can also learn all the Japanese carpentry terminology from the shop. The local vernacular buildings provided valuable living examples of how timbers are jointed or how clustering is done for a storage building, or how the roofing tiles are laid and terminated at the corners, and some modern materials such as corrugated sheets and concrete blocks are put together. We set up a workshop in a tool shed, collected tools from the village and sorted neatly for the actions. The frames were cut and pre-assembled off-site. We went to the mountains with villagers to harvest the bamboos, and learned how to drop a 20 meter long piece safely and efficiently from a steep hill. This Japanese mini truck was invaluable for moving and transporting materials in tight places, as well as moving a large number of people in one go. Yoshimura-san demonstrates how to split bamboo using a tool he designed. It was performative and theatrical to watch, we experimented with de-oiling bamboo to prevent it and learned how to look after bees in a traditional way. This is a headquarter for the village, acting as a community center, renovated from an empty house by the villagers by themselves. It has a traditional kitchen, able to cater for over 50 people, or maybe hundreds. We ate food together. Simple traditional Japanese breakfast, lunch, and dinner were served every day using fresh ingredients straight from the field, cooked by the locals. The dining room became a lecture theater for evening presentation by the tutors. The shortage of young kids forced this local primary school building to shut down. It was abandoned, adapted as a dormitory for our students. The classrooms were fitted with traditional mosquito nets and tatami mats. And the school playground became a place for experiments and production. The climbing frame was used for the drying rack. We invited a local expert plasterer, Fukuda-san, for a practical workshop to teach us how to construct the traditional Japanese wattle dove wall. It comprises split bamboo for lattice work tied with straw rope. It is about efficiency and speed of construction. The width of the gaps, it is determined by two fingers for weaving the rope through. It is rather beautiful to see the back of the wall. So we showed off the construction in the circular opening and adapted the technique for the carved soffit and that was a collective effort. We continued to experiment with bamboo for various cladding applications and implement where appropriate, for example, to protect the bottom of the mud wall from rainwater splashing back. Sorted and cleaned, 
We also figured out how to install them by suspending a button from the ridge, uh, learned from the villagers and also YouTube video tutorial from uh, temple roof construction. Everyone was busy working on the structure, like a busy bee swarming a hive. The intense building work naturally brings everyone together as a team, also the villagers. The building we were building was substantial, substantial enough for them to take it seriously. Uh, more we worked hard, they supported us enthusiastically. We joined an annual noodle festival. It's a continuous bamboo channel with water and uh, eat cold noodle from it. We organized the local kids workshop for decorating our beehive using a paint made from mud, rust, chalk, and charcoal, all from what we can find in the local landscape. And the stamps made from potato from the local fields. This brought young families to the village and also participate in the building activity. The decorated panels for the front of the beehives. And the nature is so rich, we were surrounded by bugs all the time. Our building site was joined by insects and frogs. A sliding door reclaimed from the old house, which had a bell attached so that you can hear the visitor visiting. The attic space is fitted with a tatami mat so that one can sleep hearing the buzzing sound of beehive below. This is the completed bee house and how it is used now by the villagers. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, disrupted this uh, uh, program. So instead of visiting Japan, we conducted uh, another architecture and artisan craft school in the Lake District in the UK this spring. In the pub called the Farmer's Arms in Lowick Green. The pub is now a headquarter of uh, Grisville Arts, who runs pub, sleeping accommodation, and a series of craft schools. Due to the increasing popularity of the pub food offer, they needed a new cold food store outside of the pub kitchen. Traditional Japanese storage building called Kura is lined with shikui plaster. Shikui present, uh, prevents the wooden structure of kura to catch fire, thus protecting variable contents from the uh, fire incident. And they are often highly decorated to, to give a status and meaning. Shikui is also employed in the battlefields for the fortified complex such as castles. In Himeji Castle in Hyogo Prefecture, every single wooden pieces are coated with a thick layer of shikui plaster to protect from the fire attack, which gives this uh, uh, ambiguous uh, expression where the wooden structure became mineralized. It uh, is covered and lined with ropes and buttons which provides a key for plaster to stick to. It is also used for the furnace in the factory in Fukia in Okayama prefecture. The hood for the, the furnace is made from wood and uh, it is covered with shikui plaster for fireproofing. This is inside of the, the furnace. And the town is known for its production of iron oxide pigment called Bengara. So all the plaster work has this uh, 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 pink hue. For the Lake District Food Store project, we invited the Japanese plasterer Fukuda-san again from Yamaguchi to embark on the research into the use of seaweed plaster shikui. This is him in front of his workshop in Nagato, Yamaguchi Prefecture. It is interesting to observe he uses every, everywhere to test the plaster patches and the place looked half broken, but also inhabited. And inside of his workshop is full of things. He pulls out his tools to show me. Japanese plaster trowels are very, very small. And this is a powder made from dried seaweed. This is dried seaweed called uh, ginnanso. And the shikui plaster is mixed with uh, ginnanso seaweed and this uh, hemp fiber. This is the ingredients. 
Slaked lime is mixed with fine sand, hemp fiber, and dried seaweed. The seaweed acts as a glue to strengthen the plaster and also controls the moisture contents and drying time. When Fukuda-san arrived in the Lake District, we spent a bit of time selecting the right kind of materials and tools obtainable locally. Here he is examining the sand in the local garden's shop with the gardener Matt from Farmer's Arms. Because Farmer's Arms runs pottery classes, there are a good range of sieves available. Matsela japonica is the Latin name for ginnanso, which is harvested in Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan. And this is the distribution map of ginnanso. Uh, it is currently only found in the Pacific Ocean. Um, there are red and black colors uh, for, and then for shikui, the black uh, Ginnanso is commonly used. It is harvested in the middle of the winter when the temperature is very, very cold. This is another type of seaweed called Tsunomata. Historically, Shikui plaster employed starch from rice, which is expensive, so only rich can afford to use it. But in the Edo period, which is 1603 to 1868, people discovered using seaweed for substitute, and then it became widespread to the general public. You need to dry them over two years and then boil in a slow heat until it gets melted. The name Tsunomata means deer's horn, the way it splits its leaves. It seems that the equivalent seaweed in the British Isles could be this Irish Karagin moss. This seaweed is widespread across the, the world. This is more zoomed in map of distribution around the British Isles. So during the workshop, we went to the coast to forage the seaweed and we set the fire to boil the seaweed and sieving boiled seaweed and mix all together with a puddle mixer. And all of us were busy doing carpentry, ready for plaster. Maybe just this it was the 12 participants and uh, the carpentry and the building work were led by the uh, Greiser Arts in-house carpenters makers Tom Philipson and uh, Simon uh, Asses Smith these are the traditional English oak lats and local basket weaver Owen Jones taught us how to split lats from a log using simple tools. It is about following natural grain of the wood and working along it to extract uh, uh, most out of one uh, piece of log. And every step involves different tools. Lats were nailed onto the frame and Fukuda-san's site made portable rack to hold the lass at high level. Uh, it was quite fascinating to observe how he can adapt and improvise many things like this, including access platform and temporary roof very quickly. Shikri Prasta is the right class. We wanted to make the round plum to the front. It is made up of things we collected from the field, from chicken wire to bracken uh, leaves. And it was plastered over using the pigment Shikri Prasta as if uh, it is a masonry column. And we coated all the exposed timber uh, in Shikri Prasta too to give the extra protection to the timber, like Himeji Castle. <laughs> and we decorated panels uh, with par jetting. Um, each uh, participant was given a panel and designed their own uh, uh, design based on the motif about fermentation of food. Pargeting is uh, another traditional craft technique which you can find in Ingr uh, England as well as in Japan. It is a three-dimensional decorative relief. The cold storeroom is fully insulated using wood fiber board, so it has very thick door, and a kitchen window has this uh, guard-like shape window. The road in front of the pub is uh, higher than this uh, 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 ground, so you can look down onto the roof. So we decided to 
place the stone from the uh, valley. And this uh, stone is actually a residue of uh, iron smelting, uh, red oxide metal rock. And uh, it is very interesting material. The valley was uh, uh, once uh, iron mining. Uh, so it was an industrial landscape. It's quite hard to imagine in this uh, very picturesque, uh, beautiful uh, place now. And uh, uh, this uh, is interesting material to talk about, but uh, probably it's too much uh, for this lecture. So we'll be uh, reserved for the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. We have um, actually quite a while well, for 20 minutes for some questions or maybe discussion. So I encourage the audience, feel free to put any questions in the chat, but I'll maybe start off, give you a moment to <laughs> recover. But I actually, um, Takeshi, um, I actually knew of your project because of the Bridesdale um, work and find it, yeah, it's amazing. I guess it's, we're doing it both in Japan and UK, but the process or the method, it's still this collective, um, I could say collective DIY, but it's still, you know, everyone coming together to do it. So do you find, is the context different or not really? Like, even though you're working across different countries, but the method, would you say it's, or the approach, is you have this sort of collective approach. Um, and I read before you mentioned this, I was interested, like, it's not really the outcome in a way. Like, do you design, you have a clear idea of the design, like say the bee house, maybe you have an idea that you learn from the Slovenia um, kind of precedent. But in a way, like, it's just one of the words that stood out when I read about your work, you, you talk about um, anti-concept. And I think that's very interesting for a lot of, say, architecture students, we're always, you know, in the design studio class, we say, okay, what's your concept? Or how do you, you know, tell the story to then give some justification to a form? And I was just wondering if you could expand on that idea of maybe anti-concept and more about the making and the collaborative aspect. And maybe does that change across cultures or just, yeah, in your experience? Uh, yeah, that's lots of, <laughs> lots of in that kind of question. Um, Open it up. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 a great question. So the in in terms of the anti concept, um, in some way, I try to imagine myself being a carpenter in that uh, end of Edo period or beginning of Meiji period, um, who had a very kind of excited about the prospect of a new new beginning of the the changes and uh, a dream about it. They so probably imagined you know what the western building western architecture looked like and they got it wrong um it's a sort of a naive um attempt but uh i i, I do value that sort of naivety and uh, try to be uh as i suppose you know as i don't know try to be more like a sort of childlike sort of attitude i suppose um and the, those people probably don't really need uh a concept um the it's it was more um the idea that uh, the construction or material drives it rather than the 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 idea that thinking from your head so a part of the uh, important uh operational aspects that I wanted to say is this uh, um DIY that you actually move your hand move your body you carry things um, and you uh, um, use the hammer or drills or or saw or whatever. Um, so so the the act of building is is important in in this context because uh, um, partly to do with moving away from your 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 brain. Um, you wanna think through your actions, your bodies, your hand, rather than the the head. Um, in terms of a, a participatory design or the community uh, building or whatever you call it, um, it's more coming from uh, from my point of view. Uh, the 
I guess this is another thing, the resourcefulness, the this like being almost like a Robinson Crusoe in a remote island, you know, how can I make things out of whatever we can kind of at hand uh, um, we can access to as a resource and uh, and make best out of it. Um, so uh, the, for example, the people doing the budgeting budgeting is very time consuming um you know uh, the part of the crafts if you ask for professional to do it is very expensive for example mm -hmm. um, whereas you know the if uh, lots of people do it and you know, each one takes care of one panels and then you know there's something that people can enjoy but also collectively become a a, a, a quite impressive thing so and I suppose it's also, you know, economical in that sense, you know, this uh, everybody has got sort of a uh, benefit out of this. So, um, yeah, so placing the right sort of people or right uh, resources in the right place is something that I'm very interested in. So including this uh, Prasta specialist, he's, uh, you know, the Fukuda-san, um, uh, and also lay people like us. Uh, working together or the carpenter who is very skilled the Tom and Simon from Grisdale uh, who who is re ultimately responsible for uh, erecting the timber, timber frame but uh, we can also come in to, to help them so yeah it's more like a sort of a where you put them and how and I guess it doesn't matter then in a way where you are because say even the plastering can be quite different depending on where you get the soil, you know, or look different, right? The color, for example, like when you did the project in UK, it was the local soil, but even though the technique um, was, you know, bringing the Japanese plaster through, it's still different depending on the local resources that you have access to. Yes. So, yeah. And the, the building activity is, is, uh, uh, we, I think it's quite universal. Um, it's actually building is a simple act. You know, it's not like you making computer or car. Um, mm -hmm. It's much more accessible in that sense that you can understand how things are put together much more easily. Um, uh, yeah, in the kind of yeah, you know, kind of the scale of the this uh, the little construction. But uh, I think it's more also. Um, Nowadays, you know, the, people are interested in more and more um, simple construction, vernacular construction, organic and uh, uh, renewable. Environmental. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of having uh, many, many layers of uh, uh, oil-based materials to, yeah. to to make buildings, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so the. That's, I think, it's the strengths or maybe perhaps the, the future of architecture that uh, the building is very accessible for everybody, um, or for all you know races, all uh, ages, uh, generations, yeah. from kids to elderly. Uh, if you assign certain elements to do certain things, everybody can join, which I think is a very powerful tool to 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 bring together to bring people together and uh, so so community project like a kiwano sato where uh people are struggling to to bring the community together i think bringing this kind of a building project um into the community is a, is a very um uh powerful thing great so i think yeah some of the questions on I mean, look, um, one of Lucas asks, how do you see these techniques being applied in an Australian context? Um, we have to invite you over to Australia <laughs> to maybe experiment with that. But I think this idea to say, in a way, yeah, like it's more of the approach that really dependent on the local community and, you know, getting it, everyone can be involved. So I feel, yeah, if you were to say, come to Australia and we do a workshop, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it will kind of lead maybe to different aesthetic, but in a way, like, the approach would be similar, right? Everyone coming together, working on what they're comfortable with, 
Um, but yeah, I'm wondering, like, do you have, do you do drawings for the projects or is it you kind of have a rough idea of the function um, and the side and there's no like, you know, is there a set of drawings that you prepare or is it kind of, we'll do it as we go? Because for example, the, you know, the little, you said you gave each um, person to spend a panel to draw kind of the relief work. Like, I imagine that was sort of something you just asked participants that wasn't really like, you know, determined. So in a way, context is yes for material and local material, but also the approach is really universal. You know, even the water and door, that's, you know, it's just vernacular construction. So I don't know if you had any ideas, say if you were to come to Australia, do you think any of the techniques can be applied here? I, I think so. I mean, the Watton Dob is a good example. It's a very universal construction yeah. method. You know, they're everywhere in, in, in the world doing the same thing. You're just using the uh, different materials that are locally sourced. And then uh, application and uh, construction is very similar, but it's also different. So uh, that's what I meant is the uh, title of the lecture, Material Anthropology and uh, the recognizing the similarities and differences so um uh yeah i don't know about australian construction um so but uh yeah the you look at yeah i think if you do the project there you look at you know what resources available not just also i suppose the traditional or uh uh natural resources but also anything else for example the the um lake district project the timber frame is we used the large the large was abundantly available when we did this because uh, there was a widespread disease that they have to fell lots of locally uh, local large forest so it was just happened to be available at the time um which is also quite quite interesting you know this sort of uh, you know what's available now and how can you use them? In terms of a design, um, uh, it's also depending on the, the project. I mean, this kind of a small, uh, I suppose, in some way, research-led or experimental projects uh, together you do with the Gleisler Arts. We are interested in the element or aspects of a core design, and uh, but. Uh, where I'm coming in is, I suppose, to um, structure that, you know, when the people coming in and how they can uh, uh, influence on the, on the design. So um, in the Japanese project, uh, for example, I showed you a few sketch in, uh, in my presentation. That's uh, how, mu how much I produced, basically. It's basically A4 sketches. And then we worked out the, all the construction joints and but uh, what what A4 sketch does is um, to define the proportion so that you you de define the heights with depths and uh, certain sort of a height of the eaves and so on. To so so that that uh, acts as a sort of I suppose kind of framework and then kind of work uh, the detail into it and then a lot of things are improvised and uh, made. Mm -hmm. Kelly asked them, were there many happy accidents, which I imagine because maybe it's a bit more unpredictable. I imagine there would be. Maybe you can share some happy accidents or examples of unpredictable. Yes, I mean, yeah. happy accident. Um, I could only be there for two weeks. Actually, the construction continued the, that, that summer. We only uh, limited few number of people can stay, but uh, the the request or the um uh to 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 participate that the was almost a double. So Adam Sutherland, the Greisler Arts director, decided to run two different schools in a different um uh, time. So the second school was organized, you know, almost sort of a simultaneously, which I wasn't part of it, but uh. Uh, they continue the work. I mean, in some way, um, these, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's not like, a, you know, I'm, I'm controlling the site as such. So the things can just naturally grow and they're handed over to the farmers. They also did their own interventions. So 
Um, so I visited the uh, and the, the the small building last summer, and and it was quite delightful to see um, mm -hmm. things being evolved. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think similar to what Andrew was asking, he was asking, did you find the ability of the students? How, like, did you consider their ability when defining the complexity of the form? But it sounds like it's more like you had a rough idea of, you know, what you wanted, and it's usually quite a simple building, so buildable by most students, I assume. Um, and that's, you know, he's asking, well, did you have already have a design in mind you try to, I guess it's a bit of both, you know, try to upskill and teach students all these techniques like plastering or traditional methods. But wait, so were you thinking about the ability to really, you know, make it accessible or was it a bit of both not really um, minding the no, that experience? Is... And like, you know, the workshop is to teach as well. I think more and more, recognizing the the limitation of skills and um uh also the aspect of health and safety mm. and uh, yes. um so what i tend to do is more focus on finishes now that uh, rather than structure um so the also using something um more friendly and accessible mm. uh, less harmful materials such as mud you know the the, the clay and you know these uh, materials are very very accessible for any anyone uh, on all any all level of skills i think carpentry is is uh, challenging and uh, if we get involved somebody and then we tr try to get involved somebody already had experience in a carpentry mm -hmm. We have a few questions about community. Um, for example, um, some of the community, I think in Kyo and Osato, um, they're quite isolated. And if someone asked you, how can you encourage community engagement um, in isolated communities? Um, or, you know, has the community taken some of these experimental or um, merge of cultural understanding into their neighborhood? Um, and how this will change their context. I think Georgia, I'm trying to interpret this question. It's maybe like, you know, has there been an impact on the community from a cultural understanding point of view? Um, and also Artem asked, um, from what he's known, Japanese society is very mobile and people change place of residence, but I think this is mainly in the cities. Um, and in the, you know, is mobility still present in the communities that you work with? And how does this affect the community projects you've worked on? So I think Kiwana Soto, mainly the residents stay in the village, right? They don't really move. It's like I don't understand the younger people move out, but it's more of a, you know, they move out and they don't really come back. So I don't know if mobility is um, so the original intention or well, still is, um, is the this uh, um workshop or the school happens annually and um that's because they have already actively created the year calendar of the village for example potato harvesting festival in autumn um uh cold noodle uh, festival in summer and so on so it's quite busy schedule and then the, those festivals they invite local school kids in nearby town or young families to come uh, to really sort of uh, make the village more uh, active and populated and then people come and visit and do something and appreciate what they do and what they produce our program is pretty much part of that their calendar um the it's just a one summer or one spring or whenever it's a bunch of boarding students or the group comes in and then stay there uh to do something um to help you know this idea of a b uh school was to set some another uh there was already uh 
uh, beekeeping uh, going on. They're making a small amount of uh, honeys and so on, but uh, this was the expanding the activity into kind of school format um, so we can visit more regularly. But uh, in, 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 in some way, what we built is, is a secondary. What's in, most important was to we visit regularly. Um, so, you turn to the same space to, or the same place no. to communicate with the local people. Yeah. Yes. And have you seen examples of them taking what you've done um, back into their everyday life somehow? Yes. Or uh, ideal scenario would be us become their annual calendar. You know, okay, you know, summer, they, this bunch of people comes mm -hmm. as a part of like a sort of an event or. Um, but yeah, the pandemic somehow, um, uh, sadly, uh, prevented that, um, mm -hmm. that kind of a return visit, which was unexpected. And uh, we're still working uh, with them, but uh, they are also getting older and older. So um, uh, in terms of uh, the Shimonoseki, the, the project was originated by uh, Motoko Fujita. She's part of the Grisdale member. She's originally from uh, the area and uh, she's uh, very actively uh, initiating and uh, and formalizing the, the, this kind of a uh, return visit. So yeah, next project will be uh, in uh, uh, this uh, coming February and also uh, hopefully towards the end of the next year. But we're doing some project in Shimonoseki city rather than rather than a busy village. Yeah, I actually went there in 2019, just before the pandemic. But maybe I can answer one one of the community questions was like, how do you encourage community engagement? And I just think, like you said, it's about getting to know the local people and I think food and eating. You know, you kind of mentioned that as well, like all the local brand was coming together and cooking or just just sharing you know this very kind of generous sharing you know welcoming foreigners into their village um even though they are a small isolated village but it's about the people to people relationship i think it doesn't necessarily to take place during the building but all the breaks between right every night um just you know having tea together or something i think that's you know it's a human to human um sort of connection and that bridges across cultures and backgrounds. So I think that's really powerful and how the building is like the common goal that brings people together. So that, um, I'm just conscious of time. There are a few more questions. So did you maybe have five more minutes? There's some of them, um, it's quite interesting. I think I also wonder, like, you know, a lot of these beautiful projects, um, they are in beautiful settings, usually in like the countryside or some you know, very nice landscaped area um one of the questions is do you see you know how do you see this applied to cities or more, more urban areas um maybe say i think masato was asking um he's really interested in this idea of the anti-concept that we talked about and um but at the same time because you know a lot of the things we can do or imagine thanks to the development of technology is advanced a lot um and you know we might lose um, sight of this kind of attitude of anti-concept, and especially in urban areas where you know it's all about efficiency and all about construction and has to be you know more professional or more perfect. You could say a lot of regulations. Um, do you have any experience about how to apply these kind of ideas in cities or more urban areas? Yes, so I teach in Kingston University, um, and uh, last few years we've been focusing on town center. Um, it's more like a kind of regeneration project, but mm -hmm. uh, really focusing on the center of the town. Uh, um, uh, it's local to to Kingston University, so yeah, Kingston Town Center, and. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, coming up new project with Greiser Arts is also about city, Shim Shimonoseki city, and uh, hopefully working with the uh, town center, uh, kind of shopping mall people. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it's a, uh, uh, we are um, 
looking, I suppose, the ways in which the we can apply similar methodology to the the urban environment, and uh, which is also quite difficult. Obviously, it's more regulated and uh, lots of uh, uh, constraints more than the rural. Rural is in a kind of in a way it's free. I know you can drive around with a mini truck with 10 students at the back. <laughs> you know, that, that you know, sort that's sort of a... fairly hard to do now. <laughs> the area yeah, I work in in Japan, and they're like, "Oh, you can't do that anymore." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's in some way, it, some things are easier to to get by. But uh, yeah, um, in, in some way, the what what you work with is the same. You know, the kind of the limitations and 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 the people. So, and uh, also we're interested in bringing some rural back into the city. Um, so we look into the to the kind of. A, methodology that we how can you bring the the rules into the city so i don't know these are kind of a the current thinking at the moment um yeah. what is was the question sorry there was another one maybe that was it yeah i think um yeah sorry i can't get through all the questions but i think that's a great sort of wrap up to end on this idea you know even in urban areas about what you have access to you know maybe you don't have um, too much nature, but it could be interesting to think about salvaging. I think you showed some photos of abandoned houses and how you just went and took, you know, what you can. So I think in the urban setting, you know, there's so many dumpsters and so many, so much waste around that could also be reused, um, maybe mm. in this more low tech way. It doesn't always have to be, yeah, this high tech. But it seems there seems there's a temp polariness might be quite effective in the urban situation i'm talking mm -hmm. about like a festival like i don't know gion festival or mm -hmm. something Kyoto. you know there's sort of a something that transforms the the city in a kind of a limited period um i don't know again this idea of a kind of annual event or something that happens in the kind of a year calendar yeah um um so yeah so the in the kingston town center for example we started doing this candlelight procession together with the community group um, and we try to do that every year now and for doing that we erect some structures together and make little candle holders together with the, the community members I don't know these kind of things. I mean, it's quite temporary and uh, small, but uh, uh, I suppose yeah, we we try to make it kind of a some small impact. Great. I think I might leave it there this because of time. But thank you so much again, Takeshi, for joining us, and we hopefully you can come to Australia. Some have you been to Australia before? No, I haven't. Yeah, no. Right? <laughs> we need to find a way to get you here and do some of the workshops. I think. It would be amazing. But thanks so much for sharing your insights. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, thank and you. And we'll hopefully keep following your project. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a Bye -bye. good day. You too.